Well, welcome New Day. Whether you're joining us here in person or you're joining us online, let me say how happy I am that you decided to give a little bit of your time to uh, join us for what is week six of our current teaching series called The Pursuit of Fulfillment. Now, every single week online, in person, we have first-time guests. For those of you joining us for the first time, The Pursuit of the Fulfillment, it's a, it's a systematic study through the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. Now, today we find ourselves in chapter 3. Last week we covered the first half of the chapter. This week we're covering the second half. Our text today is Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verses 16 to 22. I want to begin today by reading you our text, and I want you to pay special attention to the parts of the text that we've highlighted. Here we go, picking up in verse 16. Solomon says, I also noticed that under the sun there is evil in the courtroom. Yes, even the courts of law are corrupt. I said to myself, in due season, God will judge everyone, both good and bad, for all their deeds. I also thought about the human condition, how God proves to people that they are like animals. For people and animals share the same fate. Both breathe and both must die. So people have no real advantage over the animals. How meaningless. Both go to the same place. They came from dust and they return to dust. For who can prove that the human spirit goes up and the spirit of animals goes down into the earth? So I saw that there is nothing better for people than to be happy in their work. That is our lot in life. And no one can bring us back to see what happens after we die. Now I ask you to pay special attention to the words and phrases that were highlighted. And if you were paying attention, you noticed that the first thing highlighted was the courtroom. The second thing highlighted was the courts of law. And the third thing highlighted pictured God as judge. And friends, we know that a judge presides over a courtroom. So the clear theme of verses 16 to 22, the clear theme is the courtroom. That's our theme today, the courtroom. Now, last week where we left off, Solomon told us in verses 1 to 15 that there's an appointed time for every activity, even an appointed time for judgment, which comes after we die. Last week, he told us that when we die, we will stand in the courtroom of God to give an account of our life. And that's where we ended last week's sermon there in verse 15 that says, after we die, we're going to stand in the courtroom of God to give an account for that which is past. That is for how we lived our life. Well, this week, Solomon's going to continue developing this courtroom theme that he started last week in verses 1 to 15. And Solomon wants his audience to know right off the bat, that standing in the courtroom of God won't be anything like it sometimes is standing in the courtroom of man. So if you're taking notes, here's your first fill in the blank. Write this down. Solomon explains, number one, there's corruption in the courtroom of man. So our theme is the courtroom, and the first thing Solomon wants us to know is that sometimes, not always, okay, but sometimes, there's corruption in the courtroom of man. Solomon says in verse 16, Moreover, I saw under the sun, that is, here on earth, in the place of judgment, that is, in the courtroom, wickedness was there. And in the place of righteousness, iniquity was there. What Solomon's saying is, in the courtroom where I was expecting to find justice, I was surprised to find corruption in its place. Now Solomon spoke about this corruption in another book he wrote called the book of Proverbs, where in chapter 17, verse 23, Solomon wrote this, a wicked man accepts a bribe behind the back to pervert the ways of justice. 
And what he's talking about here are corrupt judges. Okay, are all judges corrupt? Absolutely not. But here he's talking about those who are. And sadly, that is sometimes the case. In the courtroom of man, sometimes you see corruption instead of what you're looking for, which is fairness and justice for all. For example, in 2011, take a look, Judge Mark Arthur Civarelli Jr. was sentenced to 28 years in federal prison for his involvement in what's been dubbed the Kids for Cash scandal. Here's the story in a nutshell. There was a uh, private for-profit juvenile facility, and the owners of this juvenile facility offered to give a cash kickback to Judge Civarelli for every juvenile that he sent to their facility. So he just began sentencing one juvenile after another, you're guilty. His trials would often last only two minutes, which makes perfect sense because if you've just decided to send the defendant to prison before you've even heard the case, then yeah, why make it last a long time? And he just sent juvenile after juvenile after juvenile after juvenile into this facility. This resulted in he, as well as his business partner, another corrupt judge, to receive $2.6 million over the year. Now this judge, He was known as like Mr. No-Nonsense, and a lot of people thought this guy is no-nonsense, and he gives out these strict, uh, you know, rulings because of his uh, devoted commitment to justice. But no, that turned out not to be the case at all. He gave out these strict rulings because the tougher he was, the richer he and his corrupt partner became. And so there we see an example of corruption in the place of righteousness, the courtroom, instead of righteousness and justice being there. Instead, there was iniquity. Instead, there was wickedness. Another sad story, disappointing story, comes from Justice Sylvia G. Ash. There was a certain chief executive of a credit union who stole $10 million dollars from that credit union. And he was able to cover up his embezzlement with the help of Justice Ash. You see, Justice Ash sat on the board of directors of this credit union and was in cahoots with this executive. Specifically, she falsified certain documents that had tried to justify millions of dollars in payment from the credit union to this particular executive, and she signed something, and it was absolutely not true, but she signed it saying, yes, this is true, these payments are justifiable. Justice Ash, 62, was charged with one count conspiracy to commit obstruction of justice and two counts of obstruction of justice. Why did she do what she did? Well, because she received tens of thousands of dollars per year in reimbursement from the credit union as well as other benefits, including airfare, hotels, food, and entertainment. So that's back to Proverbs 17, 23, kind of accepting a bribe to pervert justice. There's many other examples I could give you, but we'll suffice it to give you just one more. One final story comes from New York Supreme Court Justice Gerald Philip Garson. Justice Garson heard divorce and child custody cases in Brooklyn, New York. And for a fee, he would manipulate the outcomes of divorce proceedings. And here's how it worked a fixer would contact someone going through a divorce and offer to steer the case towards a sympathetic judge. After receiving payment, the fixer would direct his client to a corrupt lawyer. The fixer and the corrupt lawyer would then uh, get in touch with uh, court uh, employees to override the court's computer system, which was originally programmed to just randomly distribute cases to various judges. This, of course, would result in the corrupt lawyer's client 
appearing before Justice Garson, and Garson would then rule in favor of the lawyer because the lawyer was paying him off with drinks, meals, cigars, and cash in exchange for the ruling that he wanted. Again, in the place of righteousness, in the courtroom, wickedness was there. In the place where you're supposed to see justice being done, instead, iniquity was there. Now, back in chapter 1, you may recall, if you've been with us for the whole series, Solomon says, there's nothing new under the sun. And isn't that true? As there are sometimes corrupt judges today, so was the case in Solomon's day. Not all of them were corrupt, mind you, but some of them were corrupt. Now, please understand that Solomon is using the courtroom of man as a foil for the courtroom of God. Solomon, in our next point, is going to try to show us how just and perfect and righteous is the courtroom of God, and so he sets up as a foil the courtroom of man. He mentions it. He brings it up. He points out its imperfections and shortcomings so that he can compare it and contrast it, showing how different the courtroom of God is compared to to the courtroom of man. So if you're taking notes then, the second thing we see in our text is this. Take a look. Solomon says, though there's corruption in the courtroom of man, the next thing Solomon says is, but there's justice in the courtroom of God. There's justice in the courtroom of God. Solomon says in verse 17, a- after observing the corruption in the courtroom of man. In verse 17, Solomon says, well, I saw this and I I thought in my heart, God will bring judgment. That is, in his heavenly courtroom, God will bring judgment to both the righteous and the wicked, for there will be a time for every activity, a time for every deed. Back in verse 1, Solomon told us that there's a pointed time for everything that takes place place throughout our lives. And here in verse 17, Solomon says that when our time on earth runs out, there's an appointed time for judgment in the heavenly courtrooms of God. And what Solomon wants us to know is that the courts of God won't be anything like the courts of man and how sometimes the courts of man can be, namely, sometimes they can be corrupt. Solomon wants us to know that there's no bribing justice God Almighty. There's no perversion of justice in his courtrooms. You can't offer him airfare and generous reimbursements. You can't slip him some cash. You can't call a fixer. There's no corrupt lawyer that partners with justice Almighty God. No, in the courts of God, there's just justice. In the courts of God, He rewards the righteous, and retribution is the lot of the wicked. So what Solomon's saying is this, in a world where God exists, even when his human agents of justice fail here on earth, God, the heavenly agent of justice, will never fail. That is, even if justice fails, is sometimes perverted here on earth in the courtroom of man, one day God is going to set the record straight by rendering justice for all the wrongs that were done on this earth. So far, Solomon has shown us what it's like in a world where God actually exists, but now he's going to kind of switch gears, and he's going to get into a hypothetical scenario and kind of show us what life would be like, though, if God didn't exist. So far, he said there's corruption in the courts of man, there's justice in the courts of God, and now thirdly, if you're taking notes, he says this, there's frustration in a world where God doesn't exist. Now, think about it for a minute. In a world where God doesn't exist, 
there's no ultimate justice. In the cases, however few they may be, in the cases where justice is perverted, in a world where God doesn't exist, there's no ultimate justice. That which has been perverted, it's never been made right and never will be. And this is just a frustrating thought to Solomon. In a world where God doesn't exist, you're just, your fate is frustration because there's no ultimate justice. If God doesn't exist, man is just another random animal who will never stand before a heavenly tribunal to be held accountable for wrongs done on earth. And that's what Solomon's getting at in verses 18 to 21. Now, you may have been confused by verses 18 to 21 when I read them. All this stuff about man being the same as animal and there's no difference between and who knows that man's spirit goes up to God and an animal's spirit just goes down uh, in the ground and all this kind of stuff. It's like, what in the world is that about? Well, what Solomon's getting at is if God doesn't exist, because friends, let's remember for 20 years, that's the way Solomon lived. Practically speaking, he adopted the worldview of the atheist. And in his pursuit for lasting happiness apart from God, Solomon came to some very disappointing realizations concerning the atheistic worldview. Among other things, he realized if I adopt a worldview that doesn't account for God, then man, how frustrating life can be because without God, there's no ultimate justice. And this is what he's getting at in verses 18 to 21 when he says, people and animals share the same fate. Both go to the same place. They came from dust and they returned to dust. So people really have no advantage over the animals. Now that's not true at all in reality. But in a world where God doesn't exist, this is precisely the case. There's no difference between man and animal. Both from the atheistic worldview came from the dust, so to speak. They live, they die, and then they decompose and return in that sense to the dust from which the atheist believes they came. In a world where God doesn't exist, it's frustrating because there's no ultimate justice. I want to give you an example of this. Jeffrey Epstein, the late Jeffrey Epstein, along with his partner in crime, Ghislaine Maxwell, who was arrested just a couple days ago, Epstein and Maxwell worked together in procuring and sexually trafficking underaged girls, some as young as 14 years old. They would contact them under the guise of, oh, rich, famous Jeffrey Epstein, the billionaire. Oh, he just wants a massage. And then Epstein would rape and abuse these girls with the help of Ghislaine Maxwell. Epstein was arrested in 2008 for being the pedophile that he was. But then he was allowed work release because he was a billionaire, so he worked that out. And do you know for the 13 months or so that he spent in prison, 12 hours a day, he was allowed to leave the prison and go about doing whatever the heck he wanted. He wasn't working. Private detectives followed him with videos. I watched a whole documentary on it. He wasn't working. He was just enjoying life. How? Because he was a billionaire. And his money allowed him to pervert justice. Well, fortunately, he was rearrested last year in 2019. But he wasn't willing to face his victims in court. So after spending less than a month in prison, he decided to take his own life and he hung himself in his prison cell. Now, the victims were so frustrated that he wasn't watched more closely and that he was allowed to escape facing them in court. They were frustrated. One of them said this, and I quote, there's no justice in this. Another one said, once again, he had managed to escape any kind of accountability. Another victim still said, 
He escaped justice. Now, this is the perspective of those who live with a worldview that doesn't account for God. In a world where God doesn't exist, where, where we're just like animals, we live, we die, and there's no judgment to follow. Now, if God didn't exist, then Epstein's victims would be right in saying, once again, he escaped any kind of accountability. But as Christians, we know better. As Christians, we know that Epstein has not escaped accountability. He may have been able, with all his great wealth, to escape justice on earth in the courtrooms of man, but this will not be the case in the courtrooms of God. Now, those who live without the hope of God bringing ultimate justice to every situation are not able to do what Solomon advises in verse 22. In verse 22, Solomon says, So I saw that there's nothing better for people than to be happy in their work. That is our lot in life. But those who live without the hope of God bringing ultimate justice one day, even if justice is not given here on earth, far from living happy throughout their lives, they live in a perpetual state of frustration because they know that some people are just going to get away with it. And since they don't believe in God or an afterlife, they're just frustrated because they will have gotten away with their wickedness. Interesting side note, if you adopt the atheistic worldview, who's to say that that is wicked? For there to be wickedness, there has to be righteousness. Where does this concept of wicked and righteous come from apart from God? Apart from God, there is no right or wrong. We're all primordial goo, okay? You just leave that there. That's a different sermon. Those who live without the hope of God bringing ultimate justice, instead of being happy throughout life, they live frustrated because there's so much that is wrong in the world and they have no hope of anyone ever making it right. So friends, this is why I have in your notes, here's your next two fill in the blanks, this is why I have in your notes, an atheistic worldview leads to depression. But conversely, a worldview, practically speaking, that accounts for God, leads to joy. We see the same injustices here on earth. And as believers, we ought to love justice. We ought to pursue justice. We ought to live justly ourselves and pursue justice for victims of injustice. That's our Christian responsibility. But despite our best efforts, sometimes justice is not served here on the earth. But the believer in God does not just sink into a depression. The believer in God doesn't sink into despair. That's our theme, by the way, for next week as we move into chapter four, despair. The believer doesn't adopt a disposition of despair and depression and just joyless living. Why? Because we know that if, despite our best efforts to have the world be a just place here and now, if we can't achieve that ideal here and now, we don't have to worry about it because justice, God Almighty, will one day see that every single wrong in the world will one day be made right. And that's how we can be happy with our work, accepting that as our lot in life, as verse 22 says, because God's got it covered. And we can live with joy even in the middle of the mess called life on planet earth. Friends, that's the difference, practically speaking, that God makes. So we see in our text, there's corruption in the courts of man, there's justice in the courts of God, and there's frustration, maddening frustration in a world where God doesn't exist. Now, before we pray and go our separate ways, we're going to do that shortly. But before we do, I want to remind you that it's not just sex offenders like Jeffrey Epstein and Gazelle Maxwell that will one day stand in the courtroom of God. The Bible teaches that all of us 
will have our day in court. And God wants us to understand today that as there's appointed as there's an appointed time for everything that takes place here on earth, so there's an appointed time for judgment when our time on earth runs out. This is why Solomon says in chapter 3, verse 15, God will call the past to account. This is why Solomon says in chapter 3, verse 17, that a day is coming when God shall judge both the righteous and the wicked. This is why Solomon says in chapter 11, verse 9, to be ever mindful of the fact that one day God will bring you into judgment. And it's why he says in chapter 12, verse 14, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. This is why the apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 14, verse 12, so then one day God will require of us to give an account of our lives. So there's a day of judgment coming. There's an appointed time for all the activities of life. And when our time on earth runs out, when our life is over, there's even an appointed time for judgment. And God wants you to know that because he loves you and he wants you to be prepared for your day in court. Now, I thought it would be fun to just kind of point out to you the fact that on that day, the books, which are the records of your life, they will be open and God will mete out justice. And I thought it would be fun to share with you what it'll be like on that day if you're a believer in Jesus compared with what it'll be like on that day if you're not. So let's just take a look at the slide. If you are a believer in Jesus, then in God's heavenly courtroom, here's how it's going to work for you. God will preside as judge. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 17 says God shall judge. So God will preside as judge. Now Satan is the prosecuting attorney. Revelation chapter 12 verse 10 refers to Satan as the accuser. So he is the prosecuting attorney. Jesus is your lawyer. 1 John chapter 2 verse 1 says if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father Jesus Christ the righteous one. And friends, the word advocate here has a legal meaning. So quite literally, yes, Jesus will be your lawyer. Advocate means counselor, and that is a legal meaning. So Jesus will be your lawyer. Now, the case will be made for where you spend eternity based on the record of your life. Revelation chapter 20, verse 12 The Apostle John writes this, And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. Friends, these books contain the various activities of your life, the good things you've done, the bad things that you've done. Meticulous records are being kept throughout your life and will be presented to justice, almighty God, on the day of your trial. Long story short, God will call the bailiff, no doubt one of his archangels, to bring the evidence contained in these books to his bench. And God will quickly see the various sins you committed. Some small, some not so small, but the record of them all will be placed in front of God. Since God is not a corrupt judge, and since you will have been proven to indeed be guilty in committing many sins, God will sentence you to death for breaking his holy law. God told Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, on the day you eat the forbidden fruit is the day you shall die. Romans chapter 6 verse 23, the wages of sin is death. So you being guilty and God being just will execute justice. He will hit his heavenly gavel and declare you guilty. But here's the deal. It's at this point that your lawyer will speak up. Pointing out that he has taken upon himself the punishment your sins deserve. And God, seeing that justice has indeed been served, will readily dismiss your case. And instead of heading to hell for all eternity, you'll instead head to heaven. That's how it'll work if you're a believer. Now, on the other hand, if you're not a believer, here's how it'll work for you. God will still be your judge. Satan will still be your prosecuting attorney. The books which contain the record of your life will still be open, 
And no doubt some angel will present the evidence to God at his bench. But here's the deal. You just won't have a lawyer. You won't have a lawyer. You'll be all alone. And when God, not being a corrupt judge, sentences you to death for breaking his holy laws, there will be no one to speak up in your defense. With no one having taken the punishment of your sins in your place, the only one left to receive the punishment for your sins will be you. Instead of having your case summarily dismissed, God will strike his heavenly gavel declaring your guilt and your sentencing will begin immediately and will be carried out eternally. Friend, God wants you to know and he wants me to know that this is how it will work when we die. This is how it will work on Judgment Day, and he wants us to know this so that we can prepare for that day. God wants us to understand that there's an appointed time for everything, your birth, your death, and everything in between. But when your time on earth runs out, eternity begins, and there's a day of judgment appointed where you'll stand before justice almighty God in the courtroom of heaven. And as we've pointed out, the courtrooms of heaven won't be anything like the courtrooms of God. You can't bribe God. Death will have robbed you of all your earthly possessions, so there's no bribe you can pull out that would interest the Lord. There's no perverting justice. There's no offering God something. What do we as mortals have anyway to even offer to God? There's nothing we have that he desires except a relationship with us, which is why he sent Jesus to die on the cross in our place for our sins so that we could make peace with God. And I believe God's brought you here today or had you tune in online today so that you could hear the good news that through Jesus, you can make yourself ready for the trial that you know is coming. The time between birth and death that Solomon speaks of here in chapter 3, that's the time to prepare for trial. That's the time to get right with God by asking Jesus to forgive you of your sins. Friends, there's nothing that God wants less than to declare you guilty, and there's nothing that he wants more than to dismiss your case. But ultimately, it's not up to him. It's actually up to you. You have to choose to prepare for trial. For all who would like to do this very thing today, it would be my privilege to pray with you as we end our time together. If you're comfortable doing so, would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? And not out loud, but would you say something along these lines to God in your heart? Say, Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for letting me know in advance how it'll work when I die. God, knowing I can prepare. God, it's amazing that though my sins deserve death, that Jesus took upon himself the penalty and punishment for my sins. Jesus took on himself what I deserved to happen to me because I've broken your holy laws. God, it's incredible that you would allow what Jesus did on the cross to be counted as payment in full for the debt of my sin. God, I don't understand it, but God, I'm just thankful for it. And so today, God, I'm asking that very thing. Count what Jesus did on the cross as payment in full for my sins. By faith, I'm trusting Jesus to take care of the problem that sin has created, namely the problem of death. Thank you, God, that Jesus is now my advocate, my counselor, my lawyer, and that I can be dismissed when I have my day in court. My case can be dismissed because of Jesus. It's amazing, God, and I'm so thankful. I ask that you would help me from this day forward to follow 
closely after you. I can't do it on my own, but I know that with you all things are possible. God, I pray this prayer in the precious name of your son Jesus who died for me. Amen. Thanks for listening to this podcast. To learn more about our church, visit newdaychurch.cc. If you've been blessed by what you've learned and would like to support our ministry, you can give a one-time or reoccurring gift online at newdaychurch.cc forward slash giving.